Happy Sabbath to everyone. Oh, you guys are so tired and sleepy right now. You should see what's happening there at Children's Church. They're much more excited, guys. What happened with time, huh? That we get so quiet. Um, I'm glad to be back. Last uh, Sabbath, our church here was closed. We were having celebrations there for Alumni Weekend. I don't know if you got a chance to go, but I know for sure it was a great event uh, and a beautiful moment to, to see the future and, and see what God has been doing already for the school. So I'm glad for that. But now we're back, okay? And we need to get back to that whole rhythm, right? So I'm glad to see you guys, glad for International Children's Care to be here represented as well. Um, I'd like to invite you guys to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. And today we're starting off a new chapter, so I'll invite you to start chapter, uh, open up in chapter 10. And when you have found it, you can say International Children's Care. International Children's Care. You found it that quick? Oh, that, that was very fast. You have a bookmark, Pastor. You got a bookmark. It's already there in Luke, right? We, we, we've been talking about Luke for the last year and a little bit. So, so very well. Let me have a quick word of prayer before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together, for this family, Lord, man, where we can not only worship together, but also where we can find comfort, we can find friendship, we can find accountability. Uh, we're just pleased, Lord, to be in a place, a safe haven that we can call. Um, we're just glad, Lord, to, to have this place that we can call church. So, Lord, be with us this morning and all that we do. Uh, may the words that are spoken here today be for all your honor and your glory. And we leave this place with a committed heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Very well. About two weeks ago, we were finishing up chapter 9. And quite a significant uh, chapter. Chapter 9 started off with Jesus sending out his 12 disciples. And the, the chapter is full of, uh, full of ups and downs with lessons that the disciples need to understand about discipleship. Chapter 9 closes with Jesus teaching about what discipleship is all about again. And chapter 10 starts off in a very similar way as chapter 9. Because in the same way that chapter 9 started with the sending of the 12, chapter 10 now starts with the sending of the 70. Jesus has more followers, obviously, but he wants to not only have them as followers, he wants to have them as disciples, and to be a disciple is to go where Jesus sends you. So Jesus is now sending these 70 individuals uh, for mission as well. And as I was reading this, these verses, I, I remember the, the good old days when I was 15 years old and I went canvassing. Who has been canvassing here? It's quite the experience, right? I went in Brazil for my first time. You go selling books, you know, from door to door, and several things happen. You know, I almost got mugged. I was going to uh, deliver a book, and the guy said that he didn't want it anymore, and he threatened me with a, with a gun. Um, so a lot of things can happen, right, when you're trying to do the work, right? Obviously, the guy who threatened me with the gun, he threatened me with the gun after I called him off, you know, saying that, you know, the country is not moving forward because of people like you. So, I, you know, I, I had my fault as well. It's not like I was like this saint, you know, I had my, maybe I didn't take the, the, the perfect approach. Um, but there's all these possibilities that happen when you're out there, you know, and, and when I was reading, you know, this chapter, uh, the beginning, at least chapter 10, um, it kind of reminisces, you know, when you are, when you're, when you place yourself in a position of vulnerability, you know, for God's cause. So chapter 10 starts like this. Let me, let's read it all together. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he, he himself was about to go. Now, if you remember last sermon, uh, Jesus was going to go to Samaria and his, he sends some disciples to prepare the way. And what happens? Samaria doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. So this is pretty much what Jesus is doing. He's sending some disciples, 70 now, so that when he goes to these cities, the way has been paved for the ministry of Jesus. Verse 2. 
Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And I don't, I don't think much has changed from the times of Jesus to nowadays, right? There's a lot of work to be done, and, and there, there are, there's a big need for more, for more laborers. People that are willing to live out the gospel, not only uh, accept it in theory, but actually live it out. Because in the end of the day, discipleship, to become a laborer, is something that is a calling of somebody who accepts and goes. You cannot coerce somebody to be a disciple of Jesus, right? We need to pray to God. Because God knows the hearts, and the Spirit can work in the hearts of individuals so that they can feel committed that they are being called by God for service. So Jesus says, pray for God to send more laborers, right? Verse 3, go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among, among wolves. And what does that mean? That's, that's the best description that somebody can give on vulnerability. Of putting yourself in a vulnerable position. If you think about ministry and you don't think about vulnerability, maybe you should rethink about what you're doing, right? Because at the end of the day, putting yourself in positions of ministry is to put yourself in a position of attack, right? Of criticism, of disappointment, of frustration, of discouragement. And Jesus is just telling it like it is, right? Because in the previous story, in the end of chapter 9, there are two individuals that came to be followers of Jesus. And one that Jesus called, you know, invited to become a follower. And Jesus describes plainly what it means to be a disciple. And, the, and he does not hide the fact of what is about to come. Remember two weeks ago, one guy says, I want to follow you. Jesus says, hey, I don't have a place to sleep. I don't have a place to. I, I'd be rejected in Samaria. Is this the life that you want? Are you willing to take a life of vulnerability? So to be a disciple, to be a laborer, it's, it's to be a lamb among, among wolves. It's to put yourself in a vulnerable position. And he goes on, carry neither money bag. And let me stop right here. I remember the canvassing days, you know, where they said, don't take any money with you, right? Because if I didn't take any money with me, I would be dependent on God's providence. I would be dependent on the sale so that I could have something to eat, right? It's a lot, it's a lot of pressure for a 15-year-old, right? <laughs> to go out with no money. But it just made me remember of that, right? Nor sandals. I had my shoes on, so times have changed. And greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking. Such things as they give for the laboring is worth worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house, whatever city you enter, and they receive you. Eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick there, and you say, the kingdom of God has come, has come near you. And Jesus goes on by saying, if they reject your message, you know, there will be consequences. Because we are, we are not Actually, we are judged by the light that we receive. We are judged by how much exposure we have had towards the truth. And Jesus goes on, especially in verse uh, 13, saying, Woe to you, and he mentions several cities, right, that he has already visited. He says, Woe to you, Shurazim, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were pagan areas, right, they would have repented long ago. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for, for you. Verse 16. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So yes, I know there's a lot going on in these verses, right? And I'm trying to summarize a little bit. Because you guys are, were already sleepy when I started, right? So I don't want to push you off the cliff. But to summarize things, Jesus is send, sending the 70. He's saying there will be tough times. You'll be vulnerable. 
and giving you instruction on how to portray yourself in these towns. And if they reject, have peace of mind that if they are rejecting your message, they are rejecting you. So go in peace. Now, as we get to verse 17, that's when we get to a very complex part of Scripture, and, and you guys will understand why. Because verse 17 says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to, our, subject to us in your name. So they're excited, right? And you know why this is interesting for them to say, even the demons are subject to us? Because chapter 9 is a story that starts off by saying that the demons were doing the ministry, you know, casting out demons and everything else. But then Jesus goes to the Mount of Transfiguration, and when he comes down, what happens? The disciples cannot cast demons, right? Because they are focused on themselves rather than in the one who provides the, the power. So now there's a shift. For some reason, they apparently get it. They are dependent because they even use the word. The demons are subject to us in your name. And things start to change, right? But then there's this mysterious verse in the Bible that seems odd because as soon as they say, look how exciting that we are joyful because even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus looks and says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What? That seems quite off, right? They're giving a report, and Jesus says, I was seeing Satan fall, falling like lightning from heaven. Let us take a break here, and I want you to turn to the person next to you. And just in 30 seconds, discuss what do you think this means? What is Jesus talking about when he says these words? 30 seconds to a minute. Go. discussion going. Okay. Got an idea? A wild guess? Very well. Well, this uh, part of scripture, as I was studying this passage, there is no agreement among scholars and those who study about what this means. <laughs> so we have to work with what we have and maybe give our perspective based on what we have studied so far, right? So, and that's the beauty of scripture. You know, there, there are parts of scripture that there are different sides to it and different perspectives of what we can gain from it. But I'll say this. The idea of Satan, our adversary falling, is something that we find in especially in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel when it's describing his fall from heaven, right? His rebellion in heaven. And the whole idea of falling, of being cast down, is an idea not only of expulsion from heaven, but also of humbling. Because 
It's very interesting, especially in the book of Isaiah, it talks about how Lucifer, he wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be high. He wanted to be here. But it says, no, you're going to be cast down. You want it to pride, you're going to be humble. It, it, it uses these terminologies. When you get to the book of Ezekiel, as it's describing the king of Tyre, but it uses these terminologies of, of the, the cherubim who covers and all these things will point to a connection with Isaiah. It talks about this falling down, this humbling of our adversary as he was, you know, in his expulsion from heaven. So that's one way of looking at it, right? Looking at the past. So when the disciples were doing, you know, casting out demons, Jesus had a vision of the past. Could that be it? Well, that's one way of looking at it. At the same time, when the disciples of Jesus were casting out demons and doing the work of the kingdom, the, announcing the kingdom of God in these dark places, bringing light to where was dark, it's like the fall of our adversary was repeating itself as if he was losing territory, as if he was losing ground. The moment that a new city was accepting the truth, he was being humbled again to where he should have been. So is it the idea of present? We have the quote in Revelation, right? That says that there was war in heaven, right? And what happened after this war took place in heaven? Satan was cast down. Now some people connect this text of Revelation to the original fall from heaven, but in the context of scripture, this falling makes perfect sense in the connection of the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died in the cross, when Jesus took back what was his in the first place and became now the ruler of this world instead of our adversary. There was no more place for Satan in heaven. Remember that in the book of Job, our adversary still has access, right? Because he was the representative of, of this earth. But now Jesus Christ, by giving his life, dying and resurrecting and redeeming us, he takes that back. And now there is no place found in heaven for our adversary. So could Jesus be looking to the future and seeing the defeat of his adversary? There's so many things going on in this text, right? To see I beheld Satan, which means the accuser. I beheld the accuser falling as lightning from heaven. And as I was looking at this passage, I was thinking and I came to one conclusion. It is the idea that it can mean present and future. Now, why is that? There's a beauty in this text. And the beauty of this text is because it leads me to two points, and two points that I want to leave you off with as you leave this church today. The number one point is a simple one, and that is that our adversary is a defeated one. He has already lost. He has already a death sentence. Whatever you're going through in your life, if it's marital problems, if it's some sort of mental issue of evil trying to tear you down, if it's depression, anxiety, and whatever evil that you see in your life, know that this source of evil, the being behind this evil, is already a defeated one. Because there's somebody more powerful. There's somebody, someone who has paid the price for you, has redeemed you back, and has promised you everlasting life. So our adversary is, number one, a defeated one. We need to be very clear about that, because sometimes we can get caught up and overwhelmed with the evil that we see in the world, and we forget that our adversary is a defeated one. Bible says that he is roaring like a lion, knowing that his time is, is short. 
And this brings me to my second point. When we live out the principles of the kingdom, when we announce when we announce the grace of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us, when we forgive others, when we show love to others, when we are kind to others, when we are patient towards others, when we bring light where there is darkness, it is as if Satan is falling down every single day. He is being cast down. He is being humbled again because we are announcing to the world that his time is short and that he is a defeated one. When we live out, live out the principles of the kingdom, we are announcing to the world that our adversary is a defeated one. And his ultimate defeat will come when Jesus comes back again. I hope this gives you some sort of a comfort because life can be very overwhelming. And there are moments that it feels like we are drowning in the complexity of life. We are drowning in the issues that are caused by the evilness of this world. Can we be a witness that we live in an evil world? Yes, we can. But I want you to be a witness that this evilness will one day come to an end. That this evilness, the source of the evilness, will come to an end. Our adversary is a defeated one. And when we live out the principles of the kingdom of God, we announce his defeat every single day. And he is cast down like lightning. He is humbled and reminded that he is defeated. And there is one seated in his throne in the present time that we call Jesus Christ that will come back one day to take us back, to take what is his. His children, all of us here in this place and those outside, those that he knows the heart, those that he knows the intentions, those that he died for. So today, my prayer is for you. My prayer is simple. My prayer is for you to rely in Jesus Christ. Instead of getting caught up with the evilness in the world, rely in his salvific grace. The text continues on in verse 19 by saying, Behold, Jesus says, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus is saying, don't focus on what you do. Rely on me. Focus on the fact that I have saved you. Focus on the fact that I have redeemed you and that you can have assurance of the salvation that I provide. The moment we are assured of that, our life is going to be lived differently. Our life is going to be lived according to the life of Jesus Christ. We are going to bring light into darkness, and our adversary will be losing territory little by little until his ultimate and final defeat, which is already announced. Can we pray on that and be comforted by that this morning? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you do for us and for the assurance of your salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, there is evil in this world. We see it every day. It's in the news, sometimes in the family, sometimes in the workplace, and we get frustrated with the injustice, Lord, and with its evil. But Lord, it's so comforting to know, Lord, that the being, our adversary, the accuser behind all this evil, he's already a defeated one. It comforts us to know, Lord, that you have already paid the price, that you are already aware of our struggles, Lord, and that you already have a solution to all of this mess. So, Lord, we praise you. We thank you. May our life be a reflection of your character, Lord, 
And as we live the principles of the gospel, Lord, may our adversary be humbled and cast down every single time where we show love where there's no love, where we forgive when it's hard to forgive, when we show kindness, Lord, when we are faced with hatred. Give us the strength, Lord, to live that life that faces vulnerability, Lord, but that finds comfort and strength in the command of Jesus Christ to go. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you all. You are invited to join us for lunch now.